YouTube team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video and another episode of NFL Questions from Subs, uh, which is a series where you can ask any NFL question you want to on any NFL team, player, and we answer it in a video just like this. Now, if you want to be part of NFL Questions from Subs, you can send an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com or for the patrons, you can send it directly on Patreon. If you want to become a Team Keep It Clean patron, you can go to patreon.com slash engravenvids. A team keep it clean. Y'all send in some great questions as you always do. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Oh, but before we get into it, don't let nobody kill your vibe today. Today is not the day. The first question came from my boy Sahaj. He said, Engraven, hope all is well. I appreciate it. Everything is doing is really good. Uh, he said, now, here's to my question. Do you want Tristan Colon Castillo at center over Bradley Bozeman? I honestly would prefer Tristan Colon Castillo just for the fact that Bozeman hasn't played center in four years. The last time he played center was in 2017 when he was in college. It's 2021, so a whole four years and five NFL seasons have passed. Or at least I think, but my math might be wrong. But that's beside the point. <laughs> I know he'll be practicing, but practicing can only do so much. Tristan Colon Castillo has played center in an actual NFL game before and balled out. But we'll see. I just want your input. All right, so this is a, a great way to start off questions from subscribers with a really good question. Um, so he said he prefers Tristan Colon Castillo over Bradley Bozeman uh, since Tristan Colon Castillo has actually played an NFL game at the center position. Uh, and I can understand why you would think that. I can understand your reasoning on that because it makes sense. Tristan Colon Castillo has NFL experience at the center position. Uh, but with Bradley Bozeman, see, this, this is where training camp comes into play. Bradley Bozeman is most likely going to get the job. He's most likely going to get the job since he's been a starter on the offensive line already. But I think something that really helps Bradley Bozeman with him going back to his natural position at center. So he got the experience, just doesn't have the NFL experience, but him going back to his natural position at center is the fact that he played guard. So him having played guard before, that helps his understanding of the entire offensive line. That helps his understanding of what everybody around him needs to be doing, Help his understanding of their assignments. And as a center, he knows what he needs to do, but he'll also understand what they need to do too. Now, of course, training camp has to happen. And with Bradley Bozeman, it's not technically set in stone, but I think it's pretty much set in stone that he's going to be the starter. Um, but it's nice. See, this is what I was talking about before, too, when I've mentioned our offensive line situation, that this year is looking good right now because of quality depth. Quality depth. We have guys that are backups like Tyree Phillips. Well, guys that are projected to be backups because nothing set in stone, but most likely they're going to be the backups with guys like Tyree Phillips, Patrick McCarry, Tristan Colon Castillo. But these guys are backups, but they have experience starting and not only starting, but starting in the NFL. So that's a beautiful thing uh, when you look at it from that point of view. So at the center position, uh, may the best man win. Next question came from my guy, Anthony L. He said, hey, what's up? Hope all is well with you and the fam. Uh, I heard you in 410 Sports Talk. Shout out to those guys. And yes, good timing because today, well, you're not going to see this on the day that it comes out. But today is June 3rd. And I will be going on their channel tonight to talk about some Ravens. But anyway, um, he said, I heard you, guys, you and those guys talk about how James Prochet and Boykin could potentially be on a hot seat, in which I agree. I also think that with the wide receiver room getting bigger and more talented, in my opinion, and the hires of T. Williams and Keith Martin... Uh, ain't it, ain't it T. Martin and Keith Williams? I, I keep getting their names confused. It's T. Martin and Keith Williams, though. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, he said, uh, with those hires, the head offensive coordinator, Huncho himself, Mr. Greg Roman, I think, is on the hot seat as well with pressure to deliver. For sure. For sure. Like, for sure. And I don't even think, um... Well, yeah, though, adding those guys does put extra pressure because I think that's one of the Ravens' ways and the draft, too. The draft and free agency. They signed Sammy Watkins. They drafted Rashad Bateman. They drafted uh, Tylen Wallace. So the receiver room, like you said, has been upgraded. It's, they've added more talent. Uh, but I think that it that does put more pressure on Greg Roman to really uh, get these guys involved, really. And for this offense, even though the offense has been good now, they, they lead the league in scoring for the past two years, ever since Lamar been a starter. Week one, they led the league in scoring the past two years. And they obviously lead the league in rushing by far. But it's a, it's a challenge for him to up the passing game. 
like to really up it and and up it when it counts the most up it when their backs are against the wall up it when they have to absolutely pass consistently i think that's that's the biggest challenge right there up it when teams know it's coming are you still able to execute Greg Roman is definitely on the hot seat. All right, next question came from my guy Terrell B. Shout out to you and your pops, man. He said, what's up, Engraven? Hope all is well with everybody. The fullback position. Could it be that we drafted a fullback this year because of Project Pat, a.k.a. Patrick Ricard, having to play both sides? Um, also, the new fullback we drafted can play both fullback and tight end, so maybe he can be utilized as a multifunctional player. Uh, well, that second part for sure. Um, I think he's going to have a tough time making a roster, though. I really do. I do not think it's set in stone that he makes the roster uh, because he is in a very, very crowded group uh, with all them tight ends that the Ravens have right now. Uh, and of course, Project Pat ain't going nowhere. Um, but he that could be a possibility that they have Project Pat playing some more uh, defensive line, especially since you would expect them to incorporate the wide receivers a lot more. So that could mean a little bit less of Patrick Ricard. Yeah, probably a little bit less of Patrick Ricard because they're probably going to line up in more four or five wide receiver sets. Um, so instead of having him just at fullback, maybe they will put him on a D-line a lot more this year. Uh, now with Ben Mason, um, he, yeah, we'll, we'll see what his role is. Because obviously, like you said, he can do multiple things. And Ravens, they love that. They love when guys can do multiple things. But maybe one of his secret roles could be special teams. Next question came from my guy Brady. I wonder if he's related to Tom. Anyway, he said, uh, hey, Engraven, I'm a big fan of the work. Keep up the good work. My question is, I appreciate you watching the videos. Though. My question is, uh, in personal opinion, on the Ravens drafting Rashad Bateman in the draft, can this open up Hollywood's career a lot more than it has the past two seasons? Well, for sure. Before I even start reading it, the rest of it, for sure, of course. Sammy Watkins does that. Rashad Bateman can possibly do that. We'll see how he does on an NFL level. But yes, because this will give teams other receivers to have to prepare for. So yes. Anyway, he said with Bateman possibly and most likely being the number one guy, can Hollywood be more effective at a number two wide receiver position than he was as our number one wide receiver when opposing defenses were more worried about Hollywood and mainly just him? See, I, I, that's, I don't even think it's, it, it doesn't even have to do with the whole number one, number two receiver thing. Teams who are, they were worried about Hollywood taking the top off, just beating the defenses over the top, just worried about him breaking off a long play. So they were always worried about him. And other than that, they were like, okay, we ain't really got to fear nothing else. So with these other receivers, they can open up Hollywood's game. and just really open up everybody else's game too, but for Hollywood, for sure. Anyway, he said, for example, kind of like a Calvin Ridley type of situation on the Falcons with Julio being the number one guy and Calvin playing a bigger part than he would as the number one guy on the Falcons. Ah, okay, the good, good example. Uh, I know Bateman will not come in looking like Julio Talent right away, but with the Ridley and Hollywood comparison, it could indeed be the case on this team. But just wanted to get your opinion on that. Keep up the success and stay safe. Appreciate it, Brady. So, yeah, man, um, they, uh, Bateman and Sammy Watkins, they, they can both have a big, imp a huge impact on Hollywood's game in a, in a positive way. Next question came from my guy, Lewis. Shout out to my guy, Lewis, because he must be Tony Pojan's agent, best friend, cousin, brother, something. Because this dude, he loves some Tony Pojan. Anyway, his question is, you ain't graven. Been listening a long time and love your content. I appreciate you and everything you do. Now, I appreciate you and I appreciate your consistency, too, most of all. Uh, he said, but man, have you seen this Tony Pojan dude from UVA? This guy is Gronk 2.0. This man is 6'7", 260. I feel like we just got a gym, and we didn't even have to draft him. Look at his tape for me, and please let me know your thoughts. I could easily see us passing up on this guy. Uh, another Darren Waller fiasco happening. Uh, let us know your thoughts, and if not, still here for the Team Keep It Clean game. All right, I appreciate you, man. Um, but, yeah, he has been, like, every video. Uh, there was a while for every single video. He would say, hey, Tony Pojan, Tony Pojan. Um, but I did look at him and like, yeah, he does literally look like a Gronk 2.0 because his number was even 87. Uh, but why he reminded me of Gronk is because he didn't have any crazy speed. He didn't have any crazy speed, but he had really good hands and he was very, very physical and like a, a, a mauling tight end. 
He wasn't a finesse tight end. He wasn't one of them pretty boy tight ends. No, he was a, a bruising tight end. One of them tight ends that'll give you a stiff arm and, and throw you to the back of the end zone. Uh, one of the things that I like about him, though, uh, he ha- he makes very he makes very concentrated, contested catches. So there was a, well, I forgot what school they were going up against. There, but there was one play where the quarterback threw it in the back of the end zone, threw it high and in the back of the end zone. To where only Tony Paul Jan could, Paul Jan could get it in, or nobody else would. So Tony Paul Jan, he jumped. He was getting hit at the same time. The the corner, the safety, whatever he was, he was obviously trying to knock him out of bounds, so it's an incompletion. But this guy, he's so big, and he had great control. He caught the ball and managed to have really great control of his body to where he was able to get that one foot in bounds. Now, in the NFL, it would have been incompletion, but it wasn't the NFL, so he had to worry about that. He only had to worry about getting one foot in. And he got that one foot in. And it was a touchdown. Um, so it's, it'll be tough for him now to make the roster because Ravens, again, they are stacked at tight end. You got a lot of competition there. But they, because uh, they, they have like eight, like maybe eight, nine tight ends, something like that. They got, like, they got at least eight. They got a lot. And obviously, Mark Andrews and Nick Boyle, those guys are the locks. They ain't going anywhere. Um, but you got to think that the Ravens will certainly uh, incorporate a third tight end into the mix. So they have their options. And we'll see. I made a best man win in that position, too. Next question came from my boy, Greg C. He said, Yo, Engraven, first I wanted to express my gratitude for not only the high quality content you deliver consistently, uh, but the outpour of positivity uh, you are spreading throughout to everyone. Uh, Team Keep It Clean to me represents what a passionate sports fan community should be without all the toxicity. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we don't want to be toxic, no. Uh, that, but yeah, seriously, no, I, I appreciate that a lot, man. Because uh, it's important. Uh, Cause I mean, the the reason why we do that is because we all need it. Uh, we all need reminders of stuff. It can be stuff that we know, stuff that we have in the back of our minds, even in the front of our minds. We may know this stuff, but we need the reminders and we need to hear it because in in this world we hear so much negative stuff every single day, all the time. Whether it's on radio, whether it's on TV, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's wherever. But it's just. Yeah, we just need more positivity, man. So I appreciate that. And he said, my question is, what new teams do you expect to make the playoffs next year? We know typically five teams from the previous year don't return, while five teams that didn't make the playoffs the year before, they do so. Mm, that's a really good question. So um, <clears throat> I could see the Dolphins. That would be one. Um, The Patriots. And I, I I think right now that's Bill's division. I do. Um, it's funny when my guy JT he was like, man, what if what if the Bills? What if they traded for Julio Jones? And I was like, oh, I wouldn't even. Oh, that would be fair. That would be so annoying if they did that. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so either the Dol- the Dolphins or the Patriots. Um, that's a AFC side. Uh NFC. Mm. Oh man, that that is this a really good question, man. Oh, uh, nah, I I don't see Raiders, Rams, and Rams made it last year. Uh maybe the Cardinals. Yeah, maybe the Cardinals sneak in there. Maybe the Cardinals sneak in there. Um, so yeah, so that would be the the Cardinals, the Patriots, Dolphins. Um, and that's really the uh the only things I could think of right now. So, yeah, that's a really, really good, tough question, too. Next question came from my guy, Chimsy. He said, hey, what's up, man? You know, I'm quite confused at our fan base for saying that Hollywood isn't a number one. It's like we forgot what he can do if the offense actually utilizes him. Look at the Dolphins game and the playoff game he's played. Obviously, he needed more help because with Miles Boykin in the lineup, uh, one side of the field is practically non-existent. Oh, boy, y'all are rough sometimes. Uh, if you look at most of the routes that Hollywood runs, you can see that the route concepts Roman has are flawed. How can you run Hollywood on a go route but have Mark Andrews or another player right next to him? If people actually would watch games and individual players, they would see how valuable Hollywood is to the Ravens. But other than that, I like what you're doing, man. Keep building. Appreciate it, man. And yeah, Hollywood is already the Ravens' number one receiver. And this is something that we've been screaming for for a long time if they could just do more with him than just a go route. All right, Hollywood, go. Fly. Go. Go for the deep ball. It doesn't have to just be that. And it, it's, it's crazy because when it comes playoff time, that's when they pull out everything for Hollywood. They pull out every type of play. They use him like he should be used. But in the regular season, they don't do that. 
It's, it's like the weirdest thing. I don't know what it is. So I wish they would just incorporate the way that they use Hollywood in the playoffs. Let's let's have that done in a regular season. Next question came from my boy Terrence M. He said, hey, Engraven, in the last two seasons, I've been noticing that on the channel, our offensive line is given a lot of flack for causing penalties. I agree that penalties are a major issue with the Ravens' ability to create momentum and score points. Uh, one thing many are overlooking is that defensive penalties with the main culprit from my observations being... Marlon Humphrey's pass interference calls. I know you have high praises for Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters, but do you think we may be giving them too much praise based on their names and a few highlights rather than looking at them under the same amount of scrutiny that Lamar, Mark Andrews, Hollywood, or Judon would receive? I definitely believe we have a Super Bowl-ready offense this year because now we have too many offensive weapons to cover everybody, and our defense is good enough to give us a fighting chance against anybody. But I like to stop seeing certain players receive passes where others do not. That is a very, very great question. Uh, now, with Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters, no, uh, they, they don't receive passes. I mean, for me, everybody gets, they, they, they get judged off of based, of, based off of what they do. Um, every player has great games, and some players have not so great games. Uh, with Marlon Humphrey, um, with pass, uh, some pass interferences, we'll, we'll call it like we see it with really anybody. Uh, if, if it's a good pass interference call, like, it's like a legitimate, hey, Marlon Humphrey, hey, he got to tighten up. Well, actually, he would have to loosen up because if he's pass interference, I mean, he was too tight on the receiver. But, uh, and if it's a bad pass interference call, like the one that I can remember off the top of my head where it was just terrible. Well, actually, no, it should have been offensive pass interference. So, sorry, I'm thinking of something completely different. I'm thinking about in the playoff game against the Tennessee Titans with that, where A.J. Brown pushed Marlon Humphrey. But, yeah, Marlon, Marlon Humphrey, he definitely has his slip-ups. He, for, for sure. Uh, and, and Marcus Peters, too. Sometimes Marcus Peters, um, I, I know he can be a very, not that it's a bad thing that, he, that he's emotionally invested, but sometimes um, his emotions can overflow uh, in the game to where if he's having a good game, hey, he's going to be talking that talk and all of that. But if he's having a bad game, you can see, and, it's, and it can be hard to sort of snap him out of that funk. Like it happened in the Chiefs game. That was one game where, oh, man, that, oh, that, game was, well, that game was really rough for everybody. But that game was really rough for Marcus Peters because it's like Andy Reid remembered Marcus Peters' tendencies, and he took advantage of them, that, that aggressiveness. He took advantage of it. Uh, now with Marlon Humphrey, um, one of his biggest things, we know fruit punch. What is the fruit punch? Pow, him knocking out that ball. And with that, it's like it's a gift and a curse because we love the big playability. We love the possibility that anybody that catches a ball in front of Marlon Humphrey or on Marlon Humphrey or whatever, he can knock it out for an incompletion or he can knock it out for a fumble, a forced fumble. But at the same time, there's sometimes with Marlon Humphrey, he'll go for that and he'll give up extra yards because he won't bring the player down. He won't tackle the player. And I understand, and it's the same way with Marcus Peters. Marcus Peters, he's so ready to make that big play, which we all love and appreciate for sure. But there, there's a risk. So th there's a risk involved with both of these corners in their own ways. There's risk and there's, there's rewards as well. Uh, but both of them, too, they, they do their thing. But, again, there, there's, there's room for uh, criticism as well. So constructive criticism, though. Next question came from my boy, Manuel. He said, what's up, Engraven? Shout out from Mexico. He said, I was talking the other day with one of my mentors about how people can create discipline and develop leadership skills, and then he brought the example of Tom Brady in Super Bowl 51. Uh, he said that in the second half, he rallied his team back from a huge deficit, and that through discipline of doing your job and his leadership and maintaining your focus on the game, he brought them back and won that game. It made me think that Brady is doing that same thing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now. Look at the team. They're full of talent, but had no discipline and leadership in it until he arrived. And he showed them the way to a Super Bowl. And now the organization is taking notes for when he leaves so they can do it again by themselves. Because Brady, <coughs> excuse me, is the system for the players and coaches to go to and do their job. Stay safe and healthy. And this year will be Lamar Jackson versus Tom Brady in Los Angeles, of course. And we're taking that trophy with us. That would be a beautiful thing. Send Brady on his way while sending Lamar on his way up um so but yeah he, he certainly has that element to him of leadership um and i mean brady he's he's he done done it all he done done it all what seven super bowls right six with the patriots now one with another team with the bucks seven super bowls that's that's a lot so there's obviously um he obviously knows the way to having success um and he's a great recruiter as well 
He's a great recruiter. Because guys will be like, hey, that's what Tom Brady going? I'll take less. So I can go there too. Because I know if Tom Brady's there, NFL, I mean, I'll have a chance to win a Super Bowl. So I want to go where Brady's at. Uh, so yeah, that's that's some good points you made. Next question came from TRM Wayne. He said, what up, Tramp? Hope everything is going well. Uh, I got two questions. If the Ravens get in the top 20 in passing, do you think Martin or Williams will take that OC spot from Greg Roman? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, only if Greg Roman, if they get to the top 20 in passing, then Greg Roman's job would probably be solidified. But then at the same time, somebody on the outside looking in may be like, oh, Greg Roman got to the top 20 in passing for the first time in his career. You know what? Let me snatch him up while he's hot as a head coach. So that's something to think about. So only if Greg Roman were to leave that way by getting hired by another team as a head coach, then I think uh, Martin Williams could step into that role. Next question. He said, with the addition of the staff and players, uh, it, give me a prediction of Lamar Jackson's stats for the upcoming season. I appreciate your response and hope y'all are living your best lives. Appreciate that, man. Uh, Lamar Jackson stats predictions. Y'all know I don't like these number prediction stuff, but I would say uh, 3,800 yards. I will say, uh, oh, 17 games. So I'll say 3,900 yards. Um, 38 touchdowns to 11 intercept. No, to, yeah, to 11 interceptions. No, 10 interceptions. So 38 touchdowns, 38 passing touchdowns, uh, 10 interceptions. Oh, rushing too. Rushing, 600 yards, and six touchdowns. <laughs> Next question came from my boy Logan. He said, I noticed in rookie minicamp that Rashad Bateman was wearing number 12. Devin DuVernay already wears number 13. Who do you think will win number 13? That's DuVernay's. Rashad Bateman, he's already going to be wearing 12. That's his official number, so you ain't even got to worry about it no more. Next question came from my boy Kevin. He said, Dang Raven, hope all is well. I was looking over the Ravens offensive lineup and I thought of something from last year. Everyone and their mother used to talk about how Lamar was finally figured out because he either ran or passed to his two favorite targets, Hollywood and Andrews. That being said, now Lamar has his go-to guys plus new additions in Sammy Watkins and Rashad Bateman. Options which not only can make our passing game less predictable, but open up opportunities for Action Jackson to take off. Do you think these new additions will force defenses to figure out Lamar all over again, potentially returning the MVP to his 2019 glory? Yeah, they, they never figured out Lamar in the first place. That That's something that a lot of people would try to say, oh, the, the league is either going to figure out Lamar or they have figured out Lamar. No, that that, that didn't happen. It, it, it really didn't. Um, so when people say that, it's like, oh, really? Nah, yeah, that ain't go down. Um, because... A lot of people like they like to say, "Oh, he regressed." Lamar Jackson regressed, but if you if you coming off a a, a a super, I mean not a Super Bowl, excuse me, an MVP season, that means you were the most valuable player, not in your division, not in your conference, but in the entire league. You were the most valuable player in the entire league. Of course, it's it's gonna be hard to follow that. And then, especially with the season that it was, and then the whole C-19 and all that mess. But, yeah, L Lamar Jackson, he, he got a big opportunity. And one of the biggest reasons I think he got a big opportunity to possibly get to the MVP status. But even if not, to be really, really good this year, especially better from last year. Because, one, there's a full off season. Two, the offensive line. The offensive line, it seems like they made some major improvements on the offensive line. And they really... Uh, made some investments there. And then three, uh, the weapons that he has, too. So, uh, Ravens and, and four, coaching. Coaching staff uh, additions as well, like with Martin and Williams. So, th those are very, very big. Um, and I think those will be major difference makers. Those four things will be major difference makers this year to where it'll be another year where they say, oh, man, we thought that they had them figured out, but they didn't. And last question on this episode of NFL question from subscribers came from my guy, Enonic. Shout out to Enonic. He said, Ingrave, hope you and the fam are doing well. Outside of the Ravens fan base, it seems to me like the national media is hyping up Bateman a little too much. While I see him and Tylen Wallace both as additional pieces that the Ravens offense needs, others talk as if he's the savior of the franchise. It's like they are ignoring the fact that he's just a rookie. That's a really good point. Uh, because he, he, got, he made it to the NFL, but now he's got to make it in the NFL. Big, big difference. But anyway, he said, question one, do you think the media is putting too much pressure on Rashad Bateman? Uh, pressure on him? No, I don't think they're putting too much pressure on him because being a first round pick, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you regardless. Uh, and it's going to come from the media and especially him coming to a team where receivers are con continually talked about. 
So that that's going to be pressure automatically. Do I think it's too much? No, because he plays the wide receiver position. As a wide receiver, uh, especially when you get drafted in the first round, you're typically going to a team that needs more of you, needs better of you. So it, it's, it's no pressure. That I don't think it's too much at all. Um, and then he said, question number two, do you see him as complimentary as a complimentary piece to our offense or our clear outright hands down number one wide receiver? I think it's to be determined. I, I can't say what he is yet because we haven't seen him yet. Like you said, it's just been we, we see, I mean, we obviously seen him in college, what he can do. But now, like I said, it got to translate to the NFL. We got to see what he does now that he's here because he, he, he made it too. But now he's got to make it in the NFL. And there's a big difference. It doesn't always translate for everybody. Not everybody gets it right away. Some things take more time than others. But based off of what he did in college and how we saw him there, then he's going to have every opportunity to. And I, I, it just, I think depending on Sammy Watkins' health, that'll have a lot to do with it, depending on that health. Because I really think that Rashad Bateman could end up really getting a lot more playing time depending on Sammy Watkins' health. Because Sammy Watkins obviously is going to be a big part of this offense and this team and whatnot. Um, and Rashad Bateman, that, Sammy Watkins can allow Rashad Bateman to sort of ease on in there. And there will be less pressure. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how it all goes together, man. How, to, how they really put this whole thing together, especially when they come out of them four and five wide receiver sets. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to be nice, man. It's going to be nice because guys are going to have to respect that pass. Well, Ravens need to make them respect the passing game first and foremost. Uh, and he said, thanks. And P.S., can you please send some of that warm weather to Maryland? Feels like March instead of May. <laughs> well, he sent this on May 12th, so a little behind. But anyway, you get the point. Love y'all, team. Keep it clean. Thank you all for watching this episode of NFL Question from subscribers. And we out.